Thank you all and thank you, Peter. I want to bring you greetings from Lutheran Theological Southern Seminary, which is a mouthful. So we just usually say Southern Seminary, a lot easier. It's my privilege to be the provost there, which means I'm essentially functioning as the president of the seminary, and I get a chance to know through our emphasis in military chaplaincy some of the fine chaplains that come through our school. You may know that we're located in Columbia, South Carolina, which is in the backyard of Fort Jackson, and you also certainly know, because you, most of you have been there, that Fort Jackson is the place where the, the chaplaincy schools is, are located together, and it's my privilege to get to know the folks over in those programs. and. Uh, we're really delighted to have so many chaplaincy students. I'm very happy to say that we just found out, where's, where did Philip go? There he is. Philip just graduated last May, Philip Scarborough, and just found out that he's going to be commissioned on, on next Tuesday and uh, off to serve the Navy chaplaincy. And we're very proud of you, Philip, and it's been a great pleasure to get to know you. Uh, Peter is graduating uh, this May and will be in the same position very soon. So. Uh, Really fun to be with you guys and to be with all of you chaplains um, from various armed services and other institutions as well. Thank you for this, er, for this invitation. Uh, Frank Clausen is the one who invited me to speak with you today, and I'm grateful, Frank. Thank you very much. Frank has become a good friend in a short time, and I'm delighted to, to uh, go to the endorsers meetings with him and to uh, experience the joy of those times. Frank gave me a very happy subject today, which as a teacher of preaching, I'm delighted to be able to speak about. Uh, the subject is the power of the spoken word. And when Frank shared that topic, I said, that sounds great to me. We all know that we live in a cacophony. We are surrounded by so many words and so much noise that it's really hard to find where any word of value resides. I have a friend who wrote a book, uh, The End of Words, because his theory is that we're so surrounded by so many words of, of such indeterminate value that finally we, we can't trust words at all. The other day I was pulling up to a stop sign and my car began to vibrate. And as I sat there, another car comes up alongside, the windows are down and the bass is pounding so violently out the, out the window that it reminded me of the time that I stood on deck of an aircraft carrier during flight ops. The inside of my stomach was shaking. And I couldn't help but hear the words because they were so loud. And the words that were coming out through this song or rap or, or whatever it was trying to be were words that were vulgar and dirty and cheap and dehumanizing. We have words everywhere, words surrounding us, words drowning us in noise. We hear words on TV programs and talk radio YouTube, telemarketing, phone calls, infomercials, and advertisements, endless words, 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 endless, annoying, meaningless words surround us. We can't shut them off. We can't find a way to turn down the volume and have a time of silence. We can't find any peace because of all the words that surround us. I imagine that in the chaplaincy, you have other kinds of words that are very difficult to deal with. Words of combat, words of command, words of conflict, words of complaint, words of constant criticism. Immersed in a sea of discourse that can have the power to demoralize people, to debilitate them, to destabilize them. Words all around us. The question is, how can we shut out the noise and find words in our lives that actually matter, that actually have value, words that are the pearls of great price? I was reading recently of a, a startling to me a historical fact. Did you know that in the early 19th century, the mineral aluminum was the most expensive mineral on the planet. We don't think of it that way nowadays, but at that time, it was the most expensive because it could not be found anywhere in nature in its natural state. Now, the surprising thing is that aluminum is one of the most abundant elements on the planet. It, it, it exists in compounds that make up as much as 8% of the Earth's crust. And yet, because it didn't exist as an independent, standalone uh, element that you could stumble upon in nature, 
it was very, very expensive. In 1885, when they erected the, the Washington Monument, just to show off, they put a six pound pyramid of pure aluminum at the very top of the monument, just as a way to say, we can do that. A year later, in 1886, a young chemist by the name of Charles Hall came along. He was 23 years old, and he was playing around with aluminum compounds, and he finally found a way to extract aluminum in a way that was cheap and easy and efficient and plentiful. And in that short time, aluminum went from being the most expensive element on the planet, $550 per pound, to 25 cents per pound in a very short time. All of that changed because the most common element now was readily available. It is so commonplace for us now that we make soda cans out of it and aluminum foil and we crumple them up and we throw them away and we oftentimes don't even think about whether or not we thought to recycle them. Aluminum is about as cheap as you can get. Words are so common in our culture that they also become the cheapest things in the world. The question is, are there any words that have meaning still and value for us today? Pure aluminums extracted from the ubiquity of the aluminum compounds found in the earth. Words that shine like gold, real gold, that, are, that can be distinguished from the fool's gold that has sent so many people crazy. Words that sparkle like diamonds as distinguished from the cubic zirconium and the, the costume jewelry that is everywhere. Are there real, true, meaningful words of value? I want to confirm today, I want to testify, and I'm using that word because I heard of its importance yesterday in the conference and how often it was used among you. I want to testify to you today that the words that you speak professionally as chaplains are among the most highly valued words that can be found in this sound saturated culture. You'll have lectures from your teachers, lectures from your commanders, lectures from your wives <laughs> and your children. All of these are important, but they do not have the capacity for deep meaning, resonance, and impact that your words that you speak in your capacity as chaplains this is true because your job and mine as a pastor and a preacher is to bring a word of comfort and hope in a world of, that is desperately in need of peace and calm. We preachers often wonder as we speak, is actually anyone listening or are we, are we just adding to the noise? One day when I was on vacation with my son who was about 15 at that time, we were in northern Wisconsin where I grew up. And he came to me and he said, hey, Dad, let's go into Grandpa's den and grab one of his, uh, his 22 rifle and let's go out into the woods and shoot some cans, do a little target practicing. Sure, that sounds like fun. So we go into my dad's den and we take the rifle off the shelf and we head off into the woods where we do the, the shooting, the target practicing. And as we're going out, we get about halfway out there and I stop and I say to Jake, uh, Jake, I've, I've got the rifle here. Do you have the cartridges? And he says, yes, I've got them right here. And then he pauses and says, but Father... Who will provide the sacrifice? <laughs> uh, I wanted to ordain him on the spot. <laughs> he was paying attention. A teenager who listened to the words of the Bible, who listened to the words of the preacher. What a wonderful thing. In fact, we need to know and we need to trust, realize that they are listening. In fact, it's more than just listening. The people to whom we speak are aching, aching to hear words of hope. I always ask my preaching students, how many times a year will this happen to you, that, that on a Sunday morning people will come to you with these kinds of things going on in their lives? Uh, in one pew you'll find a person who just got engaged, and in another pew you'll find someone who just found out that they're, they're going to enter into a very messy divorce. Someone just found out that they got healed from a, a, an ailment. And another person found out that their father or their mother has cancer. Someone just learned that they lost their job. 
another person just found out that their, the, the, drop, the job they dreamed of was made available to them. Someone is there in church because they're praying to overcome their barrenness, like Hannah, because they want to have a family. And someone else, someone else just found out that they're pregnant and they're delighted. How many Sundays per year will it be the case that the people who come to you have that level of life and death concern on their hearts, minds, and souls? And of course, it's a, it's a rhetorical question because the answer is every Sunday, every Sunday, this is what we contend with. And I think the things in your settings can be even more complex and confounding. One of the graduates from our seminary, uh, a chaplain by the name of Patrick McLaughlin, now retired, he wrote a book called No Atheists in Foxholes. And maybe some of you have read that. There's one story that really struck me. He was serving in a hospital in Afghanistan. And he observed as the doctors were working on a 12 or 13-year-old Afghani boy who had been shot in, in combat. And after the surgery, some soldiers were lingering. And the, the doctor goes and says to the soldiers who had brought him in, to surgery, who in the world w w would shoot this young boy? And the soldier said, well, we did. We looked up at the bridge, and he was aiming, aiming an RPG at us, and we had to take him out. Now, I'm not saying anything that you folks on the line haven't seen a hundred times. And that's probably the same whether you're in the military or uh, on the border guards or or in VA hospitals, any kind of chaplaincy. The stakes are so tremendously high. The complexity and the soul-searing nature of episodes like that makes it absolutely clear that what these people need is not all of the sound, not all of the noise. What they absolutely need is a word of hope from the voice of a trusted person. When I teach preaching, I say to my students, there's only one cardinal rule. You can experiment with this. You can try that. You can play around with a variety of things. But there's only one thing that you must do every time you preach. And that is always proclaim the good news. Always. I have a friend who is a Methodist pastor, I think, uh, our chaplain knows him from South Africa. His name is Peter Story. And he fought alongside Nelson Mandela and Tutu, uh, Desmond Tutu, in the fight against apartheid. He is the most brilliant speaker I've ever heard on the question of prophetic preaching, which is challenging. But in the same lecture, when he talks about prophetic preaching, he also says this. The night before you preach, read through your sermon. And if it does not contain the good news, and then tear it up and throw it away. Always, always proclaim the good news, I say to my students. Now, sometimes the students come to me and they say, Professor, you gave me a really hard text. I, I, I'm struggling with this, by which they mean it's, it's, a, a, it's a text that is easy to see the law, but I can't find the good news. I always smile and say, you know, I just love it when students come up to me and tell me that they're realizing how hard preaching is. Your job is to go back and find it to struggle, to pray, to deal with the text, to dwell with it, to let God speak to you through the text so that what you will lift up is nothing but promise and hope. This is something that every preacher ought to know, but when you listen to sermons, you realize that they don't. So I'm going to say it out loud. Every preacher ought to know that there is absolutely no need to stand up in the pulpit on Sunday morning and tell people how bad they are. They already know that, and they know it far better than you do. There is no need for preachers to stand up and invoke guilt amongst their people. No need for preachers to try to bring people to shame or to remorse. Believe me, they are already there. And if they're involved in war or difficult combat situations or issues on the border or the difficulties of living in the VA and being under care, they are filled with these things. There is no need for the preacher to do that. Our job is to address these human conditions with the unequivocal word of God's grace. 
we need to find a way always to speak a word of hope. We get the opportunity to speak a word that will trump all other words that surround us in the sea of discourse. Words of love, of forgiveness, of new life. Now here's something I want to impress upon you that ought to add even more pressure to your work, but that's a good thing in this case. I want to talk about the ultimate power of the words that you and I speak in our professions, the ultimate power. There is a, a lecture series in Harvard back in the 50s, and one of the speakers was named J.L. Austin. He was a scholar who worked with how language works, and he deli delivered a lecture called, and it was later published under the, uh, in a book under the title of How to Do Things with Words. And he talked about performative utterance and felicitous discourse. Now that sounds very academic, and I don't want to make this an academic lecture, but this is really an interesting thing that he discovered. There are certain words that have the power to perform what they describe as they're spoken. A performative utterance, he called them. Now, that sounds complicated, but let me make it very simple by giving you, giving you some examples. If, if one were to say, I bet you $10 you're wrong, the bet occurs at the time that you say the word bet. Isn't that interesting? If you don't say the word bet, no bet occurs. Before you say that word, there's no bet. The moment you speak it, a bet is on hand. And that bet depends on your integrity to follow through with it. Another one is promise. I promise you this. I promise you that. And the promise occurs at the precise moment that you say the word promise. So this is what he calls a performative utterance. It performs its function immediately as it's spoken. Well, isn't that interesting? We do that all the time. We bet, we promise, we pronounce, we declare. We do all of these kinds of things. And they become only infelicitous. They only fail to work when you're insincere. You know, I, I promise I'll do that, knowing all the while in your heart you won't. In which case, nothing is performed but a lie. OK? So you get the idea of what this is about. We do these things all the time without thinking too much about them. And that's probably about the right amount of thought to give them until you think about the words that you and I speak professionally in our ministry. Now, think about that. When you speak a performative utterance for yourself to say, I bet or I promise, you're calling upon the full authority of you and no one else. You are not binding anyone else in that promise or in that bet. You are binding yourself. And as long as you are a person of character and integrity, that is going to work. The bet stands the promise holds. But think about the words you utter in your ministry. Think about what happens when you say to someone, the Lord bless you and keep you. Think about what happens when in the name of Jesus Christ you pronounce the entire forgiveness of someone's sins. My friends, you are not blessing. You are not forgiving. You are binding the promise of God to be the one who blesses. You are committing God to be the one who forgives. When you speak, you are bringing all the power and authority of God to bear on the words that you use, the words that come out of your mouth, that are heard by the people to whom you minister. Now that is a powerful word. And I want you to know that when you use those kinds of words, when you proclaim the word of hope to the people to whom you minister, those words are heard with that full authority and promise of God. If that doesn't make us a little nervous, then we're not paying attention. Imagine the thought that the words that come out of your mouth are the words that bind the power of God. Frank gave me a a scripture word to share with you. This comes from your scripture, the Book of Mormon, 2 Nephi. He suggested this, and I'm very grateful for, for this text. It says, And now I, Nephi, cannot write all the things which were taught among my people, neither am I mighty in writing like unto speaking. For when a man speaketh by the power of the Holy Ghost, the power of the Holy Ghost carrieth it into the hearts of the children of men. 
I could find a number of passages from the book of Romans and Ephesians and Galatians that would say something very similar from the voice of St. Paul. In this case, I'm very sensitive to the difference in theology between me as a Lutheran and you as members of the LDS Church. There are some similarities, there are some, some great differences, um, but here's one thing that is absolutely clear that we have in common. We have in common in our theology of proclamation this understanding that the Holy Spirit is, is the, the essence, the power, the authority that makes our preaching carry into the ears and, heart, ears and hearts of our listeners. I love the way the great theologian Karl Barth put it. He said that the best thing that a preacher can do is attempt through all his work, attempt to proclaim God's story. It only becomes genuine, true preaching when the Holy Spirit shows up to fulfill the words that the preacher speaks. Most of us, if we've preached for any particular length of time, have had this experience. You're very, very busy. Sunday's coming, another sermon. Your life is so filled with so many meetings and so many ministry obligations that you find yourself running short on time for preparation. And yet Sunday morning, you know you have to stand up at eight or nine or 10 and you have to deliver a message. And so you do, and as you step into the pulpit, you offer a prayer to God, something along the lines of, God, forgive me, I have not attended to your word in the way that I should have this week. Please make what you can of this mess. And then you preach that poor sermon. And then at the end of the service, you're shaking hands with people as they leave, and someone will come up to you, and they will grab your hand, and they will say, Pastor, Chaplain, you really touched my heart today. Just think about what's going on there. The Holy Spirit showed up, even if you didn't. We know that's true. We know that's the way God works. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that we should give short shrift to our work every week so that the Holy Spirit has lots of opportunity to bless us. <laughs> Sin boldly so that grace may abound, as Paul said. We know that's not right. But we also learn from this that it is absolutely certain that God is with us in our work. Even when we are too busy to do our work, God will show up and bless us and bless those who hear us. This is a powerful thing to think about. The words that you speak are words that bind God Almighty in the power to bring them about. The words that you speak are bolstered, are satisfied, are fulfilled by the work of the Spirit as God's Spirit comes through you and out into the people. I love the image that Bonhoeffer used with regard to preaching. He said, when the preacher speaks, it is as if Jesus were walking amongst the people in the aisles of the congregation. That is a powerful image because it is a powerful responsibility that we are given. Now, it's not hard for us to be afraid of the power of what God might do in the hands of a powerful preacher. I once was at a, a preaching conference that we held at Fuller Seminary where I used to work. And uh, for the preaching conference, we had a number of very good preachers who talked, who both gave a sermon and then talked later about their approach to preaching. And at the final moment of the, of the conference, we had a worship service where all of the attendees were there and all of the, the speakers were up on the dais as we have here today. And at a certain point, the speakers stepped forward to the front of the dais and called people forward to stand in lines in front of each of them and have them have the speakers pray for the people at the conference which was a wonderful idea and a great way to end the conference. I was sitting back there waiting and watching, and, and at a certain point, one of the conference leaders, a Pentecostal bishop, a very, very famous Pentecostal bishop from Los Angeles, uh, a person who, whose church is so large that they hold it in the, the LA Forum where the, where the LA Lakers used to play. It's a big church and a very well-known bishop in the Pentecostal church. But, his line dwindled down to nothing. And so I thought, well, why would I pass on the opportunity to go forward and be prayed over by a, a, a bishop of the church? 
So I go and I stand before him and he, he reaches down and he takes his hands. He has huge hands, a very, very big man. He takes his hands, he puts them on either, either side of my head and he asks my name and then he begins to pray for me by name in the way only a Pentecostal bishop can pray. And now he begins to pray for me that the Holy Spirit would come into my life and my family and my ministry and powerful and evocative ways and he's just gearing up for a wonderful prayer. And as he's doing that, I begin to realize that I seem to have my brain placed precisely between the palms of a Pentecostal bishop. And I begin to get a little nervous. And for the first time in my life, I did something that, that I've never done. I began to pray against the person who was praying for me. <laughs> oh God, I am, I, I, I'm just a humble Lutheran pastor. I, I'm not sure that I can handle all that you and the good bishop are used to doing together. And as he keeps praying, I keep getting more and more worried. And finally, with some measure of resignation, I pray, I conclude my prayer with something like, oh God, if it has to be tongues, let it be German. <laughs> there is power in what we say, power in the words we speak. Know that in your hands, in your voice, in your person, is the power to bring comfort to the brokenhearted, the power to forgive the deeply troubled, the power to bring new life to those who are considering suicide, the power to shine light through the darkness of PTSD, the power to heal the moral wounds that come with war. In a sea of sound, your words are the life raft for warriors wounded in so many ways. My friends, in your prayers, in your preaching, in your counseling, in your conversation, always speak a word of hope, a word of promise, a word of forgiveness, a word of new life. And never doubt that the words that you utter bear the power of God to perform the act of grace of which you speak. I'd like to conclude with one story that demonstrates the power of such words. When my daughter was in fourth grade, her teacher, Miss, Mrs. Tillman, was involved in a terrible car accident. It was one of those situations where a drunk driver went over the wrong side of the road and hit her head on. They took her to the hospital and they had absolutely no certainty that she would survive this accident. She was hurt very, very badly. Her young husband leaves the children at home and goes to the hospital to take a vigil by her bedside. And he sits there day after day for weeks, watching, praying, hoping, waiting, while his wife goes through surgery after surgery. He has absolutely no knowledge that she will survive. And yet one day after a week or so, he draws up a tremendous amount of courage and he leaves his wife's side and he walks down the hallway to the hospital room of another person. In a bed in the hospital room is the person who was driving the car that veered into her lane. And that man was hurt, but not nearly as badly as she was. He was recovering. And when this young husband walks into the room, the man in the bed begins to feel this tremendous sense of remorse and guilt for what he had done. The young husband walks up and begins to speak with the man in the bed and tells him who he is and, and asks how he's doing and asks about his life, who he is. They talk for a while. And then after a few moments of conversation, the young husband stands up and he says, before I leave, I want you to know that for what you did to my wife, I forgive you. And he turned to walk out the door. And as he's about at the doorway, a person in another bed who had observed this whole thing said, hey, say, excuse me, young man, could, could I talk to you for a second? And so he stopped and turned and went to the other bed. And the man in the other bed said, I, I saw what you just did there. I saw how your hand of Grief reached out to touch and accept the hand of remorse. I saw that. And I just want to say that if 
your God is the God who can allow you to do that, to forgive that man for what he did for, to your wife, that's a God I want to know. My friends, may we always understand the power of the words we speak. Amen.